This is Powering the Future, a podcast series brought to you by Smart Grid Forums. One planet, one power grid. Hello and welcome everyone. In this episode, we're diving into how artificial intelligence and data are reshaping the power grid uh, in terms of smart energy flows, predictive maintenance, personalized electricity, and much, much more. Now, joining us today is an expert in the field, someone who's right at the heart of this energy tech revolution. Uh, that's Leon Kuiper, lead data scientist at Steadin. Hi, Leon, welcome. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. Delighted to have you on the podcast today. So Leon, tell us a little bit about your background and the work that you're doing at Steadin. How long have you been there? What's your role as a data scientist and how are you affecting change in the power grid with AI? Yeah, so uh, I've been uh, with Steadin for about three years. Uh, mm -hmm. Before that, I worked at a few startups and uh, in a consultancy company. Um, originally a mechanical engineer by background, so the, the electrical engineering space is fairly close to what I've done. Um, we work on quite a broad range of uh, products in my team, where there's a total of 17, and there's the, I would say, the, the sort of typical forecasting methodologies like predicting where do we have problems tomorrow, how much power do we need, uh, or do we need to manage away, or like take, take away, basically. Um, but it goes from there to image recognition, uh, and so identifying is there a certain asset on a photo um, and anything in between. Great. Okay. What would you say has been the most successful use case for AI at Steadin so far? Yeah, it's, I mean, it defines a bit on what, what success is, but the, the one that, that we are currently uh, seeing quite some big changes because it's, it's when you will, will see that within more, the more conservative DSO, because Steadin is, is a big DSO, um, People tend to be quite conservative, so the use of AI isn't the way I was sort of used to it at startups, where it's just like, let's just try it and see what happens. Now it's really like, no, we first have to think about it, and there has to be a human loop, which which I, I, I'm i fully behind, and it's very uh, good to have some control. So there's, there's sort of a difference in where you see the true value and um, uh, where the um, value might be, but it's a bit more exploratory. So I, I, the, the one that we are very proud of is our, our load forecasting. So we, we recently made a, uh, a full on release where we're now predicting on like 500 spots in our grid that are actively or close to congestion levels. Right. So either they're already at congestion levels or they're close enough to it that we want to monitor them. Uh, so that's, uh, there's more the traditional AI methodology, of course. There's also in the new generative AI, what people tend to refer to now as AI, and there's a, a new initiative within Staten that we help uh, mechanics identify when they go to a certain asset and they have to do some maintenance on it. And it might be a Siemens something from 1973. Well, the people that installed it have all retired. They're not in the company anymore. And you have to go through hundreds of documents to understand what it, what it needs, what kind of maintenance it needs. So to be able to ask a question like, hey, I'm going to this asset, what do I need to do? And then uh, Jenny, I can go through all those documents and uh, return uh, maybe seven points that you have to look at, right. uh, which is something that can quickly uh, help speed up. And in practice, if you would ask the now retired specialist, if you would have asked them, they probably would have, if there might be eight things to come up with, they might have come to seven or six. And the AI system might also only come to seven or six, but at least this way you can do it with a click of a button and you don't need to have um, all that expert knowledge in your system. So that's one of the the yeah i would say the first one that we're also implementing at scale now okay that sounds like it's going to improve efficiency quite a bit have you been measuring the results at all uh, it's it's still a little bit early for that to be honest and that is also one that is quite difficult to measure because you don't know what you're missing in the, the space of generative ai you can get a feel for is it right or is it wrong but then you need the experts there all the time uh, so once you go into true operational support it's it's a bit less obvious than with load forecasting, for example, because if we're saying it's going to be 22 megawatts and it's 21, well, you have that measurement, but with gender AI, it's a bit more tricky. Um, so we're mainly focusing on user feedback for that. If, if the users say like, I'm, and that's not, we don't have enough of it yet to say at full scale, it's, it's fully wrong. It's it, our experience is that it's good, but it's, it's, still, uh, um, it's kind of early days. I mean, it's been live for half a year-ish now, so we have to uh, 
get some more uh, results for them. Now, something you mentioned, Leon, which we hear a lot, um, is that the uh, power grid environment is quite conservative and uh, you can't just run with a new idea. You really have to test it, plan it, implement it carefully. Um, tell us about how you manage risk around the implementation of AI. What are some of the factors you have to keep in mind? Yeah, so um, one of the main things that we have uh, found out, and there was a different project in what we call, we're calling automated grid design. So for all, basically brownfield or redesign of existing grids. So we're trying, we're looking at every part of our grid, uh, mainly low voltage at this point, and figure out what do we need for 2050 in this specific area. Um, which is something which is now done by a, a team of engineers. And it's a lot of manual work because they have to identify how many houses to have and all these other different things. And what we're, our approach is there, and that's why I'm touching upon that topic, is really to what is being done now by people and how would we want to do that by an AI system? And also what kind of checks and balances do people have themselves to make sure it's correct? And how could we replicate that uh, in um, in an AI system, because typically what you see is that it's quite easy in a proof of concept to make it seem like it works. So you can ask a chat GPT, you can ask a question and it's getting it right. And you're like, okay, I've, I've asked it three questions, so it must be working. Well, that's that's only, yeah, that's the, the proof of concept phase. It's really all about like, can you make it work consistently? Can you make it work robustly? If open AI releases a new version of their model, does it still work or is it now gotten it's gotten smarter, but for your specific use case, it's gotten worse. Like there's all these things in place that you have to have, um, yeah, sort of a, a check system. And that's, uh, that's, that's what we're looking at. So are there specific, so basically for these type of gen AI solutions, uh, we're looking at the, the approach with sort of fix, or like sort of, this is what the questions are and this is what we're expecting the answers to be. And then if there's an update every once in a while, you just ask, you ask it the same question basically, and then you're expecting more or less the same answers. But that does require someone to classify all of those. Say like this is what the answer should be, and once you go into operation, then that becomes a challenge. And another issue that is going to come up, and it's not come up yet, but what you you sort of see it already with software developers in Gen AI is that because you're using Gen AI a lot, the knowledge of the user deteriorates because they're not doing the thinking anymore. So at some point, they won't be able to clap. Yeah, sort of critically think about what is being done that's that's a whole other that's a whole other coming. issue yes i was going to say right now we're on that that uh sort of uh, border of we've got experts who can um critique the ai who can sense check it and so in a way uh, you know the safety around it can be managed but what do you think ai is going to do to the shape of the workforce to the the power grid workforce let's say in 10 years time so by 2035 what what what's I, going to be the uh, shape of the workforce, the profile, the requirements for the job? It's I mean I think I think generally that's that's a very tough question to answer. I wouldn't even be able to say five years from now. Um, I do see see that there's a lot of potential for better decision making. I just the tech, tech, I think you can sort of categorize AI in, into two things. It's doing what humans can do now only at larger scale and faster. And more efficiently, basically, or being able to do new things that weren't really technically possible before at all. Um, and that second one is one where we don't really, I mean, you don't really see any true impact on the workforce because it's just things that we weren't doing before. And it might create new processes and it might free up space, but it's not so much, uh, um, yeah, you, you need a different sort of person to manage that than the existing workforce. Uh, but in the existing workforce, it's, it's yeah, honestly, I it is quite a, potentially dystopian worldview that if you hear Bill Gates say that in 2035, we won't need teachers and doctors anymore. It's, that's pretty scary to, uh, to hear those types of things. And I'm not, um, I'm not convinced that it's going to happen, but it will happen in some level, to some degree, because yeah, the example of a teacher, if you have a personalized teacher, that's exactly looking at what you need rather than what a group of 20 students needs. Yeah, that, that is going to have some benefits, obviously. And that will, will have similar things within the grid space where having a system that looks at the entire space of state in our company, the entire time, with every decision it's making, rather than what one person can have in their head, is going to massively change the accuracy of what's going to come out at some point, especially if you look at the pace at which AI is going. So I find it quite difficult to answer and say this is what people will need to be, but I find people need to become comfortable being uncomfortable. I think that's the main thing. Like the world will constantly be changing. And if you, 
want to sort of stop that wave, that's just that that's not possible anymore. I, that that's I think from a um, if you want, yeah, basically, if you want to keep your job, this is a very negative way of framing it, uh, and I don't really want to do it. But the the people who will keep saying no at some point, at some point, is going to come to your door. That that's just unfortunately the um, the reality that we live in, and that's not necessarily state and world view. We have much more work to do than we have people for. Um, so it's about retraining people into uh, um, into other skill sets. Um, but it does mean that things that you're doing right now, yeah, it's quite likely that you won't be doing that in 10 years time. Right, right, um, so. so that's, that's, but that can change. Yeah. I mean, speak of a call center, we're at the world, we're at, at a space right now where AI systems are able to have a phone call with someone without them being really able to recognize that it was a computerized voice. Um, and that those kind of things, that, that's just a very basic example. But on the grid side, yeah, as I mentioned, if, if you can have someone keep the entire rule book, all the regulations in the back of their head with every design decision they make, that can be quite useful. But I also don't think that we're going to get away if, if a, a regulator steps into our foot. Why did you make that decision? Well, ChatGPT said it was a great idea. Right. I don't think that yes. that's going to work. So you're going to have to have humans in the loop and you're just going to be able yes. to work at, at larger scale and you have to be able to check the outcome of um, of the results and um, that's what it's that it's all about being able to think critically and to be able to keep thinking critically because what you see now is that people are sort of Jenny I makes it very easy to be lazy and, uh, and then at some point the few moments where you don't want to be lazy you might have become complacent in a way and that's that's a risk that I I, I see and that's yeah I, I find it very difficult to say for a specific function that this is going to change I think honestly all of the positions are going to change. My position is going to change. I think data science isn't exempt from this. I to do, yeah, training a model, that's something that an AI system could do itself. Um, so it's, um, yeah, as I said, being comfortable, being uncomfortable and adapting, I guess, to whatever comes. And uh, right now you have a centralized data team. Is that right? Yes, yes. at Steadin, yes. Do you see any changes in that in the near future? Are, are you likely to distribute the team into the domains, into the uh, specific functions more? Yeah, so there is there are already some sort of specialized, what you could consider AI teams in different uh, departments that have um, an assets specialization, for example, uh, modeling, transformers, uh, stuff like that. Um, but it's going to get easier and easier, as you said, too make your own model uh, it already did in the past uh, two years but um, i do feel that you need to have some centralized overview governance as well ai governance is the ai act in, uh, in the eu is now a big thing um, but beyond that it's also just you want to make sure that the results and quality are there and that requires experience and we've we've had some um, analysts from other departments be like well i tried to trade a model uh, here are the results it's just not really working and you just look at okay yeah, but there are like just the, the foundation that you've set is not what you want it to be because that's the, the tricky thing uh, in all of this. You have to have some understanding of what you're working on. And at the same time, you also need to make sure the data quality is there. And that's, that's, that's for me, maybe the biggest risk because if you give uh, an AI system a, a load of garbage, that's garbage in, it's garbage out, um, but it's going to be very confident in the outcome that it has. It's going to very confidently get the wrong answer. Uh, but for the data set it was provided, it's technically the right answer. So it's that's that's um, that's a very um, a difficult thing. So we are seeing more decentralization, but we are trying to, yeah, as difficult as it is with an organization of five thousand people, we're trying to keep some oversight over what's possible. Um, but at the same time, we also know that we can't stop it. We we are aware that there will be more decentralization. We're not gonna we're not trying to keep it all with us, but we're just trying to. In those spots where it's coming up now, how can we make sure that they're doing things the right way, uh, and that we, um, yeah, uh, it's sort of it's sort of allowed, I would say, uh, but under conditions. Great. Okay. And so, what do you see on the horizon, Leon? What new use cases do you think are going to transform uh, the operations? Perhaps ideas that you've got on your mind at the moment that haven't been fully explored or implemented. Yeah, I think that the biggest one in in all of this from like a congestion management approach that's also i mean for staying specifically and for the netherlands um given our fairly high congestion levels but i don't think that's particularly used um 
yeah, other countries are either close to us or will soon be close to us. I think just the, the automated steering of assets and just the control over um, optimizing your grid. We're already doing it now. We're asking windmills to be turned off at specific times or factories like, hey, maybe you could run this system from two to four in the afternoon rather than from five to seven. That would help us tremendously. Uh, but right now that's still done through a um, an human based approach, which requires a lot of back and forth discussions. And in a way, if it's a computer talking to a computer, they can make split second decisions and the other side will not get offended mm -hmm. if they change their mind. Mm -hmm. um, so as an example, we see it in the, the planning side of things where we have the demand planning side that's quite nervous about making a change to the planning requirements. Say like, well, maybe we need more people installing charging points because the other side has to build a process around it. But if those are two sort of automated systems, they can they could change it sort of daily. They could change it hourly if they wanted to. And they just see there's a big disruption. We need more people to go from left to right. And if you have a fully automated flow there, yeah, the left and the right side aren't going to get offended by each other. So I think that that's just the um, automated decision making in, in a way at, at scale. Um, that's that's why I see it. It's, it's in a lot of different fields. Um, but it, it does mean that you have to validate that it's working and you do need a human in the loop to approve a certain uh, suggestion. But right now, the human has to also make the suggestion and has to take that entire um, space of stakeholders into account that has an opinion about it. Um, and maybe that could all be um, sped up. My final question for you, Leon, is have you seen any really cool AI solutions on the market or entering the market that you think are going to be really game changing? And I'm guessing this specifically for the grid, the grid for the space. power grid, yes. Yeah, now it's I, I mean it's it's kind of interesting because I think a lot of the the things that from a DSO perspective we would need, they're already there. Like IoT systems have been around for a long time. A colleague of mine has a washing machine, and she just presses a smart washing machine, and it it basically does the laundry when the price is right. So it already there's already a system yeah. to. Like it, and those things have been around for a long time. It's it's just about getting it all together. So these integrators, true integrators, I think that's going to be um, yeah, that's going to be the thing. But that's a combination between hardware and software. Um, you can have really smart AI systems right now, but in the end, it has to yeah, from a grid perspective, it has to be able to make a decision. It has to be able to turn on that washing machine, so to speak. Um, and that's. That's where I see that the biggest changes are coming. Um, so with the rise of yeah, IoT censoring and, and stuff like that, I do think that there's a, a space coming up. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Leon. It's been great talking to you. Thank you for your insights. And we look forward to catching up with you again in some months to see how the projects have developed. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye. Join us again next week as we unpack another big topic shaping the future of the power grid. Until then, thanks for watching and for listening. Now please subscribe on YouTube so you don't miss any of the episodes and catch us on LinkedIn too. This is Powering the Future, a podcast series brought to you by Smart Grid Forums. One planet, one power grid.